Good evening and welcome here tonight to uh, 5 by 15 and I'm incredibly pleased to have Kate Moss as our guest tonight. Kate's been on 5 by 15 before, she is a, an amazing storyteller, she burst onto our book world with her extraordinary book Labyrinth, which was the first in a series that included the burning chamber, she went on to write the City of Tears, the Citadel, and these all added up to selling around about 8 million copies all over the world, 35 different languages, and Kate is an absolute fixture. But for her current venture, she has done something slightly different. Well, I might add, I should add, that she is also the founder of the Women's Prize, which has given all of us an enormous pleasure and a great lift to women's fiction. But what she's done now, she's written a book about caring. It's called An Extra Pair of Hands, a story of caring, aging, and everyday acts of love. Now, it's beautifully written and it reads incredibly easy, but it, in fact, it's a really rich book, but bursting with ideas and bursting with challenges, I think, to all of us about what sort of world we live in. And, you know, there's that saying that you can tell the quality of a society if you look at their prisons. Well, I actually think you should not say that. You should look at the quality of the society and you should look at what they do about caring. And uh, we're going to come on to some pretty scary statistics about what's happened in the pandemic. But I want to start with, first of all, asking Kate why she chose to write this book. And just to outline for us how she ended up living with her husband, her children, her parents, and her mother-in-law, the indefatigable Granny Rosie, who is now a full-scale celebrity, thanks to Kate's book, um, how they all ended up living together in a house in Sussex. Kate, welcome to Five by Fifteen. It's just absolutely brilliant to be here. And... Um... You're right. I mean, the star of this book is Granny Rosie. Um, and the joy has been watching Granny Rosie have photo shoots, go on the television with me, do radio. And she's 90 and has lost none of her zest for life. Um, and I'm now getting lots and lots of letters from people who used to know Rosie back in the day saying, oh, it's lovely to see Rosie out and about. So that has been a complete unexpected uh, consequence of the book. So I've been a carer on and off for 12 years. And it's not a word that I ever particularly used about myself, because if you're lucky enough to love your parents and love your mother-in-law, as I do, um, it feels it's partnership. It, it's about reciprocity. It's about being there when somebody needs you. The title of the book, An Extra Pair of Hands, is Granny Rosie's title. And when we were talking about it, she said, well, when all said and done, you're my extra pair of hands. And that that's exactly right. And. But at the same time, there are 13 million of us, unpaid carers, hidden in plain sight. And I realized that I needed to raise my voice with everybody else's voice to make caring visible. And this year's Carers Week in June, uh, the strap line was making caring visible and valued. And I think all the time that we don't use the word, we kind of assign it, you know, it's something nobody needs to take seriously. And I remember talking to my mum who cared for my lovely dad who had Parkinson's. She would say, well, but darling, that's the vow I made when we married in sickness and in health. So that was one of the things about writing the book. But in terms of how we all came to live together, we, my husband and I, we all grew up in Sussex. We all live now within a stone's throw of where we were born and went to school and all of these things. And my husband and I were in London, but we always kind of wanted to come home to Sussex. And Granny Rosie, when we moved back down to Sussex, not, you know, that was back in 1998, I said, you know, in passing <laughs> to Granny Rosie, so Rosie, if at any moment you'd like to come and live with us, you know, just, just say the word. And three weeks later, Rosie arrived essentially <laughs> with her electric piano, a, a few clothes, um, a couple of treasure possessions and a load of books, but otherwise traveling light. So she's lived with us for more than 25 years. And then my lovely parents moved in here where I'm talking to you from now, uh, back in 2009, when it became clear that my father's Parkinson's, he'd lived really well with Parkinson's for many years, but he caught a virus on a plane and he went overnight from being a healthy mm -hmm. man with Parkinson's at the age of 80 to being somebody who needed a lot of care. And over the years, it became clear that my heroic mum was going to need more day-to-day -day support if he was going to stay at home. And that's what we wanted and what he wanted. So then they moved in with us too. 
So then we suddenly ended up with this three generational household in, as I describe it, the house on the corner where, where three roads meet. <laughs> when did you realize you'd become a, a carer? Well, do you know, I, I've been caring full time for Granny Rosie for a, a couple of years now. There was a moment after my mum died and before Granny Rosie fell, when she was just, I mean, Rosie is happiest on a bicycle, on horseback. Mm -hmm. The very first time I met her, she was riding on a moped down uh, the lane in which uh, they lived, uh, on a horse saddle, on top of the moped saddle, in the tiniest pair of shorts, the tiniest and tightest vest, with a horse riding hat over her arm. And now Rosie's in a wheelchair. And she really resents this, that she at 90 is no longer physically able to do stuff for herself. Um, so I'm a full time carer now. I've been for about three years. With my mum, I very much felt that she was the carer and I was her carer so that I was helping her to look after my dad. My dad was a gentle, beautiful, wonderful man, and he was very easy to care for. Mm -hmm. And he found it, he made it easy for everybody else around him. Parkinson's is a very cruel and difficult illness. And I'm sure some of the people listening tonight will have experience of this. And I, in publishing the book, the numbers of letters I've had from people who are caring for people with Parkinson's. And one of the things about Parkinson's is that you don't know when it's going to affect you. So people are often, as they are with other disabilities, actually, very awkward around people with Parkinson's because they're not sure if they're drunk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they're slurring their words and staggering about the place. When people have quite big uh, freezes or shaking attacks, it can be very hard to know what to do. Whereas my dad was one of those people who made it, it easier for the people watching him to be around him if something was happening. And as a result, of course, everything about disability, everything about caring for someone is seeing the person that they are not the disability, seeing the things they can do, not the things they can't. And I learned a great deal from watching my mum and then my dad about how you care. And it's always about listening. What do they need? It's not about you, it's not about you at all. It's not about make, doing things quickly. Time, things take as long as they take. So I think I was always learning about how to care. And so when it, I needed to really step up, it, I, I was kind of, I've been prepared to do it, I suppose. So it's really interesting what you write about time and, and saying that you go on to a different time schedule because you, you make a nice illustration about, say, Granny Rosie wanting something from the other side of the room and you could do it in a nanosecond, but maybe she wants to do it because it keeps her independence. And it makes you think about all the, you know, you, you said just now there are now 13.3 million carers in the year. That's 5 million more than we had 18 months ago. The beginning. Yeah, when I wrote the book, the figure in here is 8.8. .8, right. And the figures now are 13 million because of the pandemic and how many people have needed to step up for other people because all the daycare centres, everything else that was around, stopped, you know, they stopped, so they weren't there. But of all of that 13 million probably do not have time, do they? No, and um, I think the thing that, that I feel as a feminist, um, mm -hmm. An older feminist nowadays, mm. slightly creaky knees. Well, you know? I'm an older feminist. We're, we're, we are older feminists. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and you are the queen, obviously, um, in all of these areas. But I think what is very interesting is that uh, a woman has a 50-50 chance of being a carer by the age of 59, which is the age I am now. It all happened a lot earlier for me, but I'm, I'm absolutely on that median point now. A man has those same odds at 75, which to me as my analysis based on nothing other than common sense, suggests that women care for everybody mm -hmm. and men care for their partners, male or female, uh, you know, the majority, that's what happens. So there's a lot of older male carers, but that actually women are expected to step up. And many of us like me, it is a privilege and I did it willingly. I was lucky to have two amazing parents who I loved and miss all the time. And I have an amazing mother-in-law who I've known since I was 15. My husband and I, obviously we weren't husband and wife then, but we met at school. So we have, and all of our family lives nearby. So there's a lot of support. Many women are caring for the husbands or wives of 
their parents who they don't even know. They're caring for aunts and uncles. They're caring sometimes for siblings. And everybody I've talked to, nobody resents this. But at the same time, the entire system works on the basis of women stepping up. Mm. And there are many women um, and men, of course, but in, particularly in this part of the conversation, who were not parented well. They were not loved. They were not cherished. And they're now being asked to step up for people who did not care for them. There are many women who maybe wanted children, but couldn't have them. Or women who had children who have died or who live on the other side of the road uh, world. So everything about the way it works relies on women putting whatever it is about themselves to one side to step up. And it's very important to me in the book that I, I am aware all of the time that I am so lucky. I cared for people and care for people that I loved a bit. And I am repaying a debt because they cared for me. But my experience isn't true. And there are many people who are caring for older generation and children at the same time. So this is why we need to fix the system. Because if we can all step up, great. But what about the people who can't? We need to be there for those carers and support them. So there's a, there's a whole lot of issues that get tied in here. I mean, old age, one that we tend to not like old people, we don't rate them, we think they're a nuisance, they just sort of shuffle off women who are still downgraded and the issue of care that sort of comes into the middle of those, which then explains why care is so badly rated, badly paid and badly mm -hmm. seen as a job. So um, how do you see that we could rectify this? I mean, I, I know, you know, we were talking earlier about the, again, another current government failure to deal with the Dilmot review, which was looking at how to sort out social mm -hmm. care. What do, what do you think we can do? Well. I think, firstly, the language around old age needs to change. So almost everything that you read will um, be accompanied by a very, very um, uncomfortably or sad looking person in a care home on their own, you know, all of these things. That is not statistically the case anymore. And every single piece about old age is about, oh, it's a terrible problem. But hang on, let's turn it round. Mm. What about Oh my God, the NHS has worked. What about the fact that the majority of people, if they don't have a particular life limiting illness, if they have cancer or uh, you know, whatever particular thing that is, can now expect to live into their 70s, but probably 80s and maybe 90s and even 100s. This is a sign of the incredible success of the 20, 20th and 21st century healthcare system. So firstly, Let's change that round. Are there issues that come with the population living older? Yes, of course there are. But it's also about living better lives, longer mm. lives, healthier lives, but at the same time, accepting limitations. You know, Rosie, you and I have known each other a very, very long time. Um, you have a very honorable and wonderful and vibrant history, and I have a history as well. <laughs> we can't do all the stuff we could do when we were 20, or indeed 30 or indeed 40, do we feel we are any less active or engaged or passionate because we're now in our early 60s, late, you know, wherever we are? No, we don't. Granny Rosie has raised in the last year in the pandemic, knitting at the age of 90 with arthritis in her wheelchair, nearly 8,000 pounds for the local children's hospice. So her contribution to our part of the world is bigger than many people of 25 or 40. So that I think is the first thing that we can do is to start to actually say it doesn't matter how old you are, it's about what you do, what your heart is like, what you contribute. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we all, it's one of the reasons I wrote the book, um, no politician of any political party thinks that care is a sexy issue. Mm. So they kick the can down the road. So this has all happened under a Conservative government in that the Dilnock Commission was commissioned by David Cameron in 2010. It reported in 2011. It was in the Queen's speech in 2015. It was an election commitment in 2017 and 2019. A couple of months ago, it was not in the Queen's speech again. And the big meeting about social care that should have been held a week ago was cancelled for no reason at all because they all think they can get away with it. And there are two things about this. 
and it isn't party political, although it is party political at the moment, because obviously the government in power is the one with the power. But actually, it's about saying, we the people, we the electorate, say you must sort this out. And I think that social care is as big a crisis in its own way as climate change. But it's not, understandably, a lot of younger people don't want to engage mm. with this because it seems remote, except there are 800,000 young carers in this country between the ages of five and 17. Young people who are fearful to go to school because they might come home and find their mother or father or sibling unconscious on the floor. So it's, it isn't just an issue for older people, but of course, understandably, it's not at the, 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 you know, the, at the forefront of many younger people's engagement, but we are all powerful and all of us together just need to be saying to every politician, you know what, this is number one on the list. Not all of these other things that you've told us are the main priorities for the political system, because if we don't sort it out, there will be no care. It's as simple as that. You know, people already, we've seen some terrible inequalities during the pandemic. We need to sort it out so the people who don't have families or don't have resources to care have got the proper support and we need to care for the carers who are doing all of this sometimes without respite for 24 hours a day. So of the people who, I mean, obviously, since you wrote the book, you've had the torrents of letters. Yes. Have, have you learned a lot about, about how care works? Have you learned more things? I have learned a lot. And one of the things you can imagine when I was writing this, I thought, you know, I resisted for a long time. I'm not a memoirist, really. I'm not a confessional writer at all. Um, as you know, you know, what I do for a living is make stuff up. Um, and obviously I make up stuff about women's stories and women's history, and I care very passionately about my fiction. But I was asked to write this book by the Wellcome Trust because they felt that they have a series about lives and letters, which is about asking people who are not specialists, who are not mm -hmm. professionals, to write books about areas of importance in terms of social, medical, uh, mental health care, all of these things. And I suspect, do you know, if it hadn't been Wellcome Trust, I maybe wouldn't have written it. Mm -hmm. But what I have learned, so, and I was anxious because I thought, well, it's, it's all right for me. I'm a writer. I didn't have to give up my job to be a carer. I sit here where, we, where you can see, this is where, where I work. And Granny Rosie is just, just there, the other side of the door. And if there's an issue, um, then I'm here. Mm -hmm. Many people have to give up their job to be a carer. Um, many people are living in um, environments where they have absolutely no support. Um, there's so many issues around it. So I thought, am I the right person to write this book? And then I thought, well, actually, I'm not writing a book about care. It's not a polemic about care, although I've snuck in all the figures <laughs> and all of these things. What I'm saying is this is that this is my story that you might not know this, but for 12 years I've been a carer. All the times that you've seen me at doing this thing, mm -hmm. I'm rushing back on the train because I've had a phone call. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is um, so many letters and emails, Rosie, from people saying, I'm so glad you've written this. Uh, this is my experience. I feel guilty all the time that I'm not doing enough. I feel guilty that I, my mother's in a home, but she has dementia. She has very complicated needs. I can't care for her. And what I've learned is that that awful is not only women, but it's very acutely women. Guilt. We've got to stop doing it. You know, almost everybody is doing their best, but everybody feels guilty that they're not doing enough or not doing the right thing. So that's the first thing that we've got to just make everybody be proud of what they're doing rather than always feeling guilty they're not quite doing enough. And actually, the next thing we need to do is say carer's allowance is the lowest allowance of any of mm. the allowances. It's one pound, point, uh, one pound six seven an hour. So people have given up their work to care for somebody, which therefore is not a burden on the state, is not a burden on other people. And that word burden I, I use only because most people who are cared for use that all the time. They're very worried about being a burden. Um, that's, a, that's a terribly ludicrous amount of money that needs to be changed. And you know what? The Dilnock Com Commission was a cross-party um, uh, collaboration. And every single suggestion in there is sensible mm -hmm. and affordable if it's budgeted properly and will transform 
the world we live in. And I, you know, I'm an old fashioned idealist, you know, like you, actually. No, we know we come from that same tradition. And do I think that our job is to leave the world a little bit better than when we found mm -hmm. it? Yes. Do I think the mark of a good society is how we care for the people who need us most rather than the people who are the richest, most powerful? Yes. Do I think that you reach out your hand and help somebody who needs it rather than go, well, it's your fault. You should have worked harder or had a different father. Um, I think all of the, we've lost a lot of idealism. Um, but I hang on to that. And I love the fact that at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was asked to sign up as volunteers, a million and a half people signed up within the first couple of days, because I think most people yeah. are good. Yeah, I think that that's really true and that, that we have to hang on to that. So it's very, it's very sad. I didn't know that they had cancelled that meeting again. Yeah. But I want to talk about a couple of specific things. I have, a, I have a friend and her husband's just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. It came pretty out of the blue. And we were talking the other day and we were talking about the ultimately great gift is to give someone a good death. Yes. To give them a death that is, you know, that you leave the world feeling that the world is okay, that you're not actually in a terrible state because everything's falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt when I read about your own parents' death that you enabled them to have what I call a good death, a death with as little fear and stress as possible. Were you consciously trying to do that? Yes. Absolutely. I've lived my life surrounded by old people. I mean, not older people, but, you know, my godmother died when she was 104. She was an Anglican nun. <laughs> I know. And she was really great till she was 102. And then she was really pissed off because she <laughs> wanted to see God. And she was like, why am I, why, why am I being kept waiting for this moment that I, you know, I've dreamed of or, you know, and she was fantastic. My uh, my wonderful aunt, who was one of the founders for the movement of the ordination of women, she died in her late 90s. So did both of my grannies nearly hit their 100 uh, mark. So I've always had old people around me. And you said something really true and pertinent earlier when you said a lot of people are scared of old people and they don't value them. If you've grown up in a multi-generational way and if you grow up in a small town where everybody knows everybody and um, you don't have a fear of mm -hmm. old age in the same sort of way, because it's, it's well, it's just... Alf or Ernie or Bert and you know one of the when we first did it, when we did the first bit of television Granny Rosie and I for the book um, I, I have now unplugged you'll be glad to know my phone in this room um, because we were on the television live and, and one of Rosie's friends who is 99 uh, rang up to say Rosie you're on the television and it was like oh my god but there he is ringing up because he's watching the television and he can he can see Rosie and he's thrilled so I think that that issue um but you know what? If you spend a lot of time around older people, it's not necessarily the same for everybody, of course. And people who are diagnosed with um, a life ending condition, often out of the blue, which will be very quick. Obviously there often isn't acceptance there, there is fear. Uh, so those are very different things, but we're all going to die. Dying well is part of living well. Mm. It is, um, Again, the, one of the things that's been lost in our medicalized world in the older days, you know, Granny Rosie, my mum, my dad, everybody had seen a dead person because people died at home. And my dad wanted to die at home and Granny Rosie wants to die at home. And it is tough. You know, when Rosie and I sit at the end of the kitchen table and I've got my glass of white wine, she's got her G&T. And... A couple of weeks ago, I got a friend who came to um, record her funeral music because Rosie decided that she wanted to sing her own exit music. Wow. Um, she's singing, wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. And it will all be in bits. But at the same time, that me arranging that for her, although there was a huge amount of my heart that was going <laughs> shattering at the thought of it, that is about her having agency and her leaving her life in the way that she wants to. And my dad was the same. He had a very strong Christian faith. I grew up in that environment, in that very gentle Anglican environment. So nobody would dream of talking about doctrine or judgment or any of that kind of stuff. But it was, you know, we went to church on Sundays and there was a framework to things. 
And my father's faith was incredibly reassuring for us at the end. So he wanted to talk to me about the hymns he'd want and the prayers he'd want. And my mum didn't want to talk to him about it at all. But she must have helped him because he gave me a list and it was typed. And so my mum must have done it. And at the bottom of the list of things he'd like was just this two wonderful words, thank you. And so it meant that when he did die, I knew that what we were doing was exactly what he wanted and that he was present in the leaving of his life. And I have done a lot of talking recently around the book for dying well and those kind of, and people think it's terribly morbid, but of course it's not. It's Granny not. Rosie sometimes says, I, I didn't think I was gonna wake up this morning. Mm -hmm. And one morning I will go in and that will be true. Um, but my, my granny's, you know, my paternal granny's um, sister died when she was 101. And she was uh, called Winifred. And she rang up my granny and said, Betty, the trumpet has sounded. Until the day she died, she rode around Brighton on a bicycle with a long grey plait down and she never married, you know, down her back and on a sit up and beg bicycle. And when my granny got round there, she was dead in her chair. And I think I always remembered that, the sense of the only thing you can do when somebody is older, you can't make them younger. You can't take away the pain often. You can only help. You can be the extra pair of hands. But what you absolutely can do is give them the power over their own life at the end of it. And, you know, my mum never wanted to talk about that. And so it was very different, but Rosie did and my dad did. And, and I think if we could all talk more openly about those last moments, and I'm sure you were very, you know, reassuring talking to your friend, then I think a lot of grief would not be caught up in regret. It would mm -hmm. simply be purely grief. I think that's really interesting. And by the way, I went to say to everyone, do put your questions into the Q&A. So you, you talk about dementia, but only in the sense of saying it's very difficult for people who have dementia. Now, my, my father had dementia and he yeah. was very adamant that he didn't want to leave his house. And we went into a series of different kinds of carers. And in fact, when he did leave the house, I don't think he really knew yeah. what was going on. But I, I found that I philosophically got very interested in the fact that he had no short-term memory left. Um, so you could be with him and say, cook something that he really liked to eat. And in that minute of eating, he would be totally there, totally in the moment and totally happy. But of course, when you went, he had no idea whether you'd come back or if you said, I'm coming back on the next day, he wouldn't know it. So I find myself spending a lot of time trying to work out you know, what kind of happiness was it? Is happiness made up by that moment or is happiness made up by memory and anticipation? And I don't really know the answer. And I also found that, you know, we, I got the diagnosis and I remember saying to my father, I had to come back from the doctors and I had to take his car away, which actually meant putting a wheel lock on it because once you have a dementia diagnosis, yeah, yeah. You know, your insurance is gone, everything is gone. And he was furious and he was yeah, yeah. raging around. It was a sort of winter afternoon. He was raging around the garden. And I ended up saying, it's only for a while until your memory gets better. And it was an extraordinary moment because of course I then entered into the lie, which of course we never left once you, you'd entered it. And it's very complex how you, how you cope with it. I, I mean, you feel a completely inadequate to uh, deal with this loss of memory. And, and yet it's happening to more and more people as we live longer and longer. Yes, and I mean, I, I can't remember off the top of my head the stats that I've got in the book because I'm, I'm terrible at scrambling the numbers. Um, but actually now dementia is the biggest cause of death as it were, you know, more people die with dementia now, women in particular, men still are slightly ahead on heart issues, but dementia second. Whereas 50 years ago, it, it hardly appeared. Now that's partly, because the medical profession has become better at um, identifying dementia much earlier on. Okay. Um, it's also partly because people are living longer and it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, all of our bits and bobs wear out. And so our brain's gonna wear out too. We don't entirely know why some people's brains um, switch in that way and other people's don't. And I'm very conscious that I, I had, it was a great piece of fortune for me, um, I suppose, that none of the 
the people I've cared for have had dementia. And there, it is a game changer because if you are caring for somebody with dementia who maybe doesn't even know you, for many people, they are grieving the parent they knew or the friend they knew or the husband they knew or the wife they knew or partner, whoever. But also there is sometimes a memory, um, a character change that comes with dementia, mm -hmm. which can be very, very challenging. So people who've always been very calm and lovely become very angry or very, um, uh, this is not the medical term, vulgar, um, but yeah. in terms of very uninhibited or very um, verbally aggressive or all of these sorts of things. And this makes an enormous difference. I, you know, I, I support our local uh, place, which is uh, uh, called Sage House, which is Dementia Hub, which gives um, respite care for people who are at the beginning of the dementia um, and for the people who are caring for them. And the one thing that I learned, that were well, two extraordinary things that I learned there were, Firstly, that if you go along with it, as you did, that is a kinder and happier thing to do. We all have in us a sense of honesty is more important than anything else. Well, you know, sometimes it nece isn't necessarily. It's what I, was it Chekhov that called white lies? Mm. Um, you know, that sense that sometimes when someone says, you know, is your father coming and your father's been dead for 20 years, saying he'll be here in a moment, gives solace and peace mm -hmm. and comfort and the conversation won't be remembered so that's one of the things that the idea that you let them de define the conversation not you not trying to make them yes. remember because that's not how it works the other thing that I found absolutely fascinating which maybe you came across Rosie when you were caring for your dad was that mirrors are really really challenging for people with dementia um, so that sometimes people can are aware of being inside themselves, aware that they're looking at themselves, but what they see is something so unrecognizable. And when I was there being shown round, and it's such a brilliant place, Sage House, that they have a hairdressing salon and there are curtains to go across the mirrors because very often that, that is a moment of insight as to what has been lost. So I think, it's fantastic that there's so much more knowledge about dementia, but anybody who's listening, you know, back to that thing about guilt, it's, it is a very different thing caring for somebody at dementia, with dementia at home. You are never able to turn off and it isn't necessarily the right thing. A lot of people want to stay in their own, own home, but actually might be happier with a bigger group of people. The thing that I used to find heartbreaking towards the end of my dad's life, we had carers who would come in morning and evening for the very intimate personal stuff, which he did not want my mother or, or me to do. Uh, Granny Rosie's absolutely fine <laughs> with, with all of that. Um, and sometimes the carers would come and they would sit in the kitchen and you give them a cup of tea and they'd cry because they'd just left somebody who was not going to see another human being for 24 hours. And they'd been with them for 15 minutes because that was the slot. So particularly in cases of dementia, I think that people need to really just be kind to themselves about their caring decisions. If you can afford to have care and that would help, then do it. Not everybody can. But the idea that every care home is the last, you know, the, the least good alternative, that's not true either. And a lot of the media is to blame for that. You know, there's always terrible stories about care homes. There are also lots of wonderful care homes. And I think with people often with dementia that it can be a happier environment. But, you know, everybody has to make their own decisions. No doubt about that. So one of the many questions I, I still want to ask you is, is about the different ways. You know, you mentioned your father's faith. Um, faith, do different faith groups care for people differently? Well, I don't know, obviously, how very different it might be. My godmother, the Anglican nun, was in a Christian care home. And I don't know what a, a Sikh care home is like or a Jewish care home is like or a, a Muslim care home is like. You know, if they're, you know I, I haven't done that level of research. What I do know is that I was invited to talk on Radio Islam. I've been invited to talk to a, a Jewish care group. And certainly um, within different faiths, there are responsibilities to care. Um, you know, the, the tenets of faith involve caring. 
Um, and I think that that has been quite interesting. You know, so when I was talking on uh, Radio Islam, um, we had a conversation about, well, this would be absolutely expected within our faith system, that there would have to be a terribly good reason why the family would not be caring for somebody in the same way that if a stranger arrives at your door, you are on a bound um, to give them food and drink. Um, and that was quite interesting having, not that the conversation was different, but the questions I was asked was different, were different. Um, and I certainly do have uh, Jewish friends and Muslim friends who their, their sort of ex um, expectation from their families that they, automatically would care is much higher than mine was mm. nobody would necessarily within my system have said well it's obviously your responsibility you're the oldest daughter everybody saw that as a choice I've made whereas in different faith systems there is a, an absolute expectation that the oldest daughter would do this and it is almost always the oldest daughter um, and but that again has been very interesting and getting letters and emails from different communities about the book and uh, and you know, you know me, Rosie, it's, it's made me feel very hopeful in all sorts of ways about, you see, there's so much dialogue that we can all be having with each other. And so much about how the world is, is working at the moment is about division. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, big beast punching head on. It's about black and white, about nobody. There's no um, nuance about anything. But when you get beneath the politics, normal people, and I mean that as a compliment, I mean all of us, just getting on with things and want to get on with things. But that's why it matters that we all, as normal people, start going, you know what, you, you guys, you want to be in charge, you sort this out. You know, you, you want the power, you've got the responsibility for this. And I think, you know, that there's no doubt that there could be a multi-faith and people of no faith and people who define and all the issue of care will touch everybody's family. However your family is set up, whatever faith you are, wherever you live, everybody's gonna come into contact with us at some time or another. So why don't we all just get together and try to actually make the politicians take it seriously? Well, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Do you think that for you, um, it's very interesting in your book that you find that with your father, your grief is more, more easy but when your mother dies, and she dies, I mean, although she's ill, she does die very suddenly, it hits you like a sledgehammer. Yeah, yeah, it, it did for me. Absolutely did for me, my mum dying. And um, I think with my, my, my dad, and I should also say to all of you listening, the book is full of joy. It <laughs> it's, is. It's a celebration of older people. You know, we're, we're talking seriously, and it's a, a joy for me to talk so seriously about the book. Um, but there's a lot of nature, there's a lot of, literature there's a lot of and there's a lot of granny rosie who who is obviously the the absolute star of the book uh, but i think the thing with my dad is that he he genuinely felt um that he was going to be reunited with his mother he genuinely felt he was going to see again the men who died beside him in the war um he felt that he was going to see friends that had had passed on uh, a lot earlier so there was a gentleness because he, he didn't want to leave my mum. But apart from that, he was absolutely ready for the next adventure. My godmother the same. I saw her quite close to when she died. Um, and she was just radiant with the idea of the next adventure is about to begin. And of course, that is one of the, you know, the absolute solaces and joys of faith for people who hold faith, the idea that this is one part of a story. And then there's mm -hmm. an, another much better story to come. There are many people who don't have that uh, certainty or surety. So obviously that's different. So with my dad, there was the sense of, um, I've always hated all the euphemisms about dying, passing on and all of those things. But actually I realized that that was true. That's how he felt. He did, he, you know, it felt like that. Um, talking about death to Granny Rosie, she feels when you're gone, you're gone. Mm -hmm. So, and she actually is quite comfortable with that as well. Um, so I think with my ma, she just didn't ever want to talk about any of those things. And in the last week of her life, she on the you know she died very early on the Sunday morning on the shortest day of the year, which is a year a day twenty first of December. She'd always hated. 
And on the Thursday before she died, she was on stage with the entertainment group that she and Granny Rosa were in, the old timers, in a pair of um, 87, pair of fishnet tights, singing wine, whiskey and wild, wild women, sitting on uh, the lap of a wonderful retired commander who actually was up here having a cup of tea today with Granny Rosie, he's now completely blind, but came up and they bring their, you know, and they chat about the old days and they sing um, in the kitchen. And I, I put my headphones on <laughs> if I'm trying to write. <laughs> Um, they were singing The Lonely Goat Herd um, from The Sound of Music, and that's got a lot of yodeling in it, so you don't need that when you're trying to write an article. Um, but my ma just, she wanted to leave her life as herself. She didn't want to decline. She'd seen that. And so she really was, you know, she was unwell, and then I had to call an ambulance, and we went to the hospital, and the ambulance drivers came to see how she was doing, and we were having end-of-life care discussions, and it was... How, how is this how happening? This happen? yeah. But it's what she wanted. She, you know, everybody, you know, when I rang people up, I'd put her car, Christmas cards in the post for her. I rang people up the day after she died and said, I, I, I'm really sorry, I'm willing to tell you Barbara's died. And people argued with me. They said, we saw her last week. I've just had a card this morning. And actually it was devastating. And I didn't write and I, for six months. I barely read for six months because everything about those things are about emptying your head and letting other stories come in and and every time I emptied my head I just was bereft um and it was it was terrible but once I'd come out of it I thought good for you good mm -hmm. for you you just went sayonara and off she went um and you know and so it but it's you know it's back to your question earlier let people have the death that they want if at all possible it's not always possible so, the, as we've said, the star of your book is, without a doubt, Granny Rosie, who um, it comes over as just this impossibly wonderful, irrepressible character, who everybody now all over the place knows. Does she, yeah. Is yeah. This, uh, uh, does she like all this? She's loving it. <laughs> She's absolutely having a hoot. So, you know, all of these, um, you know, the, we've done photo shoots for the Telegraph, for the Mail, for uh, Saga, for, you know, this, that and the other, radio type. You know, we've done all of these things. And everybody arrives and um, they say, you know, they send hair and makeup. And Granny Rosie said, I've never worn makeup in my life. I'm not starting now. Um, and they all come in and they and it's just hilarious because they know that there's a 90 year old woman in a wheelchair who is a cared for person. So they come in with a certain attitude about what she's <laughs> going to be like. And with it, so they say, well, you know, we could maybe take a picture in the garden. Would you like coffee? And Rosie will go. Well, the sun's over the yard up. I think I need a GNT. <laughs> um, and so then we have a GNT. And then I turn two minutes later, and the GNT has been drunk. And I go, Oh, well, I don't think we should have another GNT. But then the glass, of course, doesn't match the other photograph. Um, she is just, she is, I mean, in her own words, a one off. She, at the age of um, 15 on VE Day, she lived in a little village locally to where we are now in Sussex and she got on her bicycle and cycled to the center of town to be part of something and she was as she puts it as clever as she was naughty so she passed her school certificate very early and uh, at 17 had to buy time she got place at teacher tape train, training college she used to go to school on her pony um, mm -hmm. and worked in the fields um, shooking steves um, um, getting you know picking the fruit all of these sorts of things came from a rural farming family that lived you know in in a cottage on the big estate and so she knows everything about all of these things and then she she passed the 11 plus and so suddenly was in a very different place from everybody in her family all of whom had left school and gone straight into the fields when they were 14 um and she's super clever and hasn't forgotten a single bloody poem that she learned at school you know one tiny quote of something and she's off with the you know the the listeners or you know the, any, any, you know, any of those famous poems. And um, she's extraordinary. She was a teacher and she did her teacher training and she was sent, you know, in 1947, she was sent um, to be a, a pupil teacher and she would arrive at County Hall in Chichester um, every morning and for three pounds a month, she would cycle anywhere in the district to be a teacher. And her most recent job was, you know, when she retired um, was at the school for, uh, children with severe mental and physical and educational um, additional needs and still when we go through the town people will stop me and say 
oh, Rosie, you look exactly the same. And it, that, that's why it's a joy to be her daughter-in-law and why we love each other so much. She doesn't have any daughters, so I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. But people, she's always just talks to the person in front of her. It doesn't matter who they are, whatever their issues. She, she's, you know, she really is an extraordinary. I've been trying to get her to write her memoirs. I bought her books, I bought her pads, I bought her tape recorders. She'll talk to me about it in the kitchen when we're having a drink in the evening, but she, she, she doesn't think anybody would be interested, whereas I know. Yes. And this, you know, she's on the television, and the highlight of this was, <laughs> for those of you who watch it, we were doing Morning Live, and we had talked about it, and one of her favourite shows is Repair Shop. And they got a film of Will from Repair Shop, who is the carpenter, coming on to say, hi, Granny Rosie, I'm a great fan of yours. And that was it. She was on the phone for the next 25 minutes, ringing everybody up and saying, Will from Repair Shop <laughs> sent me a message. And she's, you know, she often feels ropey. She quite often feels she's not going to wake up. Um, and that obviously breaks my heart when she says that. But the biggest thing I've learned about it is that you've got to allow people to say those things. It's not up to me to go, oh, we're fine, you know, be Mrs. Cheery. You know how annoyingly cheery mm -hmm. I am. Um, what I've learned is if somebody wants to feel bloody awful, they're allowed to. Not up to me to go cheer up. She doesn't have to cheer up. She can feel really awful, you know. Um, I like so, yeah, she's a I, star. I, I, I really like your line when you say old, old ages and butlins, although I got a bit confused because I thought, well, butlins, you know, I mean, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> strange, strange kind of a, a competition. Anyway, Kate, we've got questions coming in. So I wondered if you'd read a bit because the book's so lovely. Maybe just read that beginning bit about your childhood and then it, it sort of ends on a, a really lovely note. Yeah, I will. And thank you. And I'd love to because the reason that I can be a carer and, and take so much pleasure in it, apart from being very lucky, is that I learned all of my life what it was to care. So the beginning of the book is Christmas 1975. My sisters and I are sitting in the back of our car, our legs touching and the seat scratchy. Street lights flash by in quiet suburban towns, then we're out into the darkness of country roads in the South Downs. Sleepy after a long day, a visit to my mother's favourite cousin and his wife somewhere in Surrey. Sandwiches for the journey home. Edam cheese, something I've never eaten before. I want to like it, but it doesn't taste of anything, and it's the texture of my swimming hat. It's winter, and we're wearing flared jeans and striped polo necks itchy at the neck beige and mustard colour, yellow, the colours of the 1970s, lava lamp prints. Or maybe not. Memory is a fickle friend and there were many such journeys to relatives at Christmas. But if the image is slightly blurred, I'm certain it's Boxing Day or thereabouts coming up for six o'clock. We're in our usual places, knee behind our mother on the passenger side, my middle sister perched and looking straight ahead, my younger sister curled up behind our father, a folded coat against the window for a pillow. In the compartment beneath a handbrake, there's a packet of tissues and a metal tin of car sweets, Fox's glacier mints and barley sugars, the brittle taste of day trips. I'm 14 and young for my age, but wanting to fit in with the more popular girls at the 2000 Strong Girls comp, the ones who smoke and have boyfriends who roll their skirts up and wear platform shoes to school. Blue eyeshadow. Imagine. I'm not sure why I remember this journey so clearly, when in truth it could have been any other December in the 1970s, perhaps visiting my maternal uncle and aunt in Adelstone, though I think that year the Christmas number one was slayed, or an afternoon spent with my paternal grandparents in Hove. Memories fragment, slip and slide, put themselves back together like a kaleidoscope. Playing I spy to pass the time until we're bored of it, the ritual of seeing which of us could count the most Christmas trees in the windows of all the houses and flats as we drove along the old coast road from east to west Sussex until the spire of Chichester Cathedral welcomed us home. Knowing that, because it was the holidays, we'd have supper on our laps in front of the television. Knowing my father would have left the light on in the porch so we didn't come home to a dark house and that our Christmas tree would be sparkling red and blue, a holly wreath on the front door. Knowing all this in advance, because that was how it always was. I didn't then, 
realize how exceptional this quiet, ordered childhood was, how ordinary and how precious, knowing that I was loved. And because of those very many years of being loved unconditionally and supported unconditionally, that what was required some 35 years later would be both possible and a privilege. That is so lovely. Thank you. That's really Thank wonderful. It just, um, it just puts it into a fantastic context that they give you life and you help them yes. out at the other end of it. And it's, yes. very, it's very wonderful. It feels very right. So I'm going to come to some questions now. Um, that's really, that was lovely, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I feel all weepy. Um, no, I know. I, had to, I did the audio book. You can imagine how long yeah, that took. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from Liz, this is interesting. Has caring affected your thoughts about your own needs in the future? Have you reassessed your life values going forward? And then she's added in brackets that she's caring full time for a 90 year old mother with Alzheimer's for the last four years and planning oh. completely changing my life once I get it back. So good on you, Liz. Um, Kate. Yeah, crikey, Liz. I mean, that, that, that's a long amount of time and, a, and a, a, huge, um, a huge commitment. Well, I think the thing is, because I've, we've lived in a multi-generational household for quite a long time, the one thing that I, I have realised is that, you know, because I've been asked this by quite a lot of journalists, is that I realised that I want, to, I, I assume that my husband and I will care for each other. I'd always assumed that. And of course, what it's made me think is, yeah, but what happens when one of us goes? And I realized that this is ridiculous because I am doing this willingly and I, I am, you know, I, and I am really proud to be a carer. Um, but I realized at the same time, I don't want my children doing this mm. <laughs> for me. It's very interesting. So I, I feel, I don't know what I feel actually, Liz. I mean, it, it has absolutely made not not made me think about reassessing my life because actually I've lived in this way for quite a long time. And as I said, you know, talking to Rosie, I don't I feel that Alzheimer's and dementia is a complete game changer. But it does make me think, well, you know, treat every day as special. You know, do the things that you have the time to do and don't waste any time. Um, but I don't know what I would feel if I needed care myself, actually. I think I'd be quite bad at accepting it. It's interesting you say you wouldn't want your kids to do what no, you do. Which is ridiculous, which is ridiculous because my my parents would, I'm sure, said the same. And Granny Rosie feels like, oh, you know, she, she always says, I don't want to be a trouble. You know, she, mm. um, but I don't feel it like that. Um, but at the same time, I want my children to be, uh, to not have that commitment, which is, which is daft. <laughs> well, as you say, it's always nothing is clear about this. It's very complicated. And a lot of people have been asking about guilt. There was a really interesting question from Emily saying, it sounds like you're saying we should change the narrative on old age by focusing on contribution, using Granny Rosen's fundraising as an example. Should we not be avoiding that as it falls into the pitfall of our ideas like you only have rights because you're productive? Something also seen, say, with refugee politics, which is massively problematical for people with disabilities. Instead, don't we need to consider people being of value and having rights simply for the fact of being rather than doing? And then she ends with, is this utopian? Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. And I, and I'm, uh, I, I think you may, maybe I wasn't clear that if you thought that that was the one thing that I was saying about uh, why uh, supporting um, aging as a positive narrative mattered. That's not at all what I, what I meant. What I meant is it's one of the things that matter. Um, I absolutely agree that you that everybody and I, I, I agree with you. I think this is a utopia, but I don't think that we should shy away from it. I think that everybody matters for who they are. And I completely agree that the idea that if you contribute, you matter more than somebody. Does. But I think that the contribution, the point I was making about Granny Rosie is that yes. she lives every day and she reads things in the paper about every day, which is it work doesn't matter and my point is that whatever people do or whatever they are matters it's not about whether you're paid for it um, or whether you're paying tax or this that this that and the other it's about what you contribute to the world around you and um, in terms of refugees and people with disability they're contributing enormously to the world around them uh, my point is that it's not about paid work it's about who you are um, so I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, 
Um, and I think that you're, you're absolutely right, that a lot of the narratives are very much, well, this person deserves more than the other person. It's, it's back to Mayhew, uh, Victorian, um, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, London labor and the London poor and the, the idea of the deserving and the undeserving poor. But my view is that you have systems that support everybody and you call upon them if you need them. Um, and that you're exactly not means testing or saying this person more, matters more than anybody else. But I, you know, I, th I, think, I, I think we underestimate how often old people are told that they're a burden. Almost every single old per person uses that phrase about themselves because they are told endlessly that because they are not in paid employment, they're a burden. But what about the fact that they might have worked all of their lives other unpaid and paid, and now it's our time to care for them. So, you know, that, you know, that's what I feel that everybody, um, everybody has a right to support, actually. Yes. So there's, a, there's an interesting letter, uh, question here from Connie Flynn, who's saying that she cared for two elderly people in their 90s in their own home until their last day and learned a lot, a lot. It wasn't easy, but I missed them. But I then her, her question is, I feel really strongly about the huge cost if someone is in an elderly person's home, but if people are cared for in their own home, there is, seems to be no value or costs cut. It's so unbalanced. And in a way that, that follows straight out of your point that yeah. um, once you cease to be productive in the type of society we have, then you know, how, how, do you, how do you value yourself? I mean, it's really sad that someone like Granny Rosie would say, I'm a burden. Which yes. is really absolutely isn't. Yeah, no, and, and to be to be fair, Granny Rosie says, I don't want to be a burden. And there is an element okay. of Frank Spencer from Some Mothers Do Have em in her phrasing of herself. Um, and you know, she but she grew up, and this is another very significant thing because I think a lot of politicians, particularly, forgive me, male politicians who have never had any caring responsibilities always talk about a utopia in the past where everybody was cared for in their own families. And, you know, this is all a modern problem because, you know, it, it, you know, the subtext is that terrible women are now going out to work and therefore they're not fulfilling their family responsibilities. That is the subtext that we get, this 1950s subtext. Whereas Rosie, you know, and I write about, about it in the book, she remembers absolutely all of her family worked on the land and everybody therefore lived in uh, accommodation that was tied to their work. And so that when they retired or were too old to work in those, those areas anymore, they had nowhere to live, maybe had lived in a place for 50 years and then it was gone. And she has very strong memories of being a child where various members, grannies and granddads in their family were quite, you know, were sent round for every three months to each of the four children. And in their house, their granddad had a bed and in one of the other houses, he had a chair in the kitchen. Wow. And that was it. Well, it's so it's, it's this, the idea of um, how we care for older people and that it was always better because everybody stayed at home in the old days. Th that disguises a, a lot of things that were really terrible about how older people were cared for. So I think in terms of the uh, inequalities of finance, that one of the biggest things about the Dilnot Commission is, how is it right that people have worked all of their life or been a homemaker supporting somebody else who's worked all of their life and paid their taxes, suddenly find that they have to sell their home in order to have any sort of care when they're older? And I think that the, these are the issues that everybody needs to talk about is, you know, what about universal provision? Mm -hmm. Why is there not universal provision um, for the people who need the support? And, the, and it's very, very low, the bar, in terms of being able to go, you know, in our district, we live in West Sussex in Chichester, there are two state-funded care homes, that's it. You know, that, that, that's it. So many people are told that, well, that's fine. You can go over there, but you're going to be 50 miles away from where you've lived your entire life. So I think all of these things are, uh, in, they're all part of what the Dilnock Commission looked into about how do you make this equitable? How do you make sure that people don't suddenly become penalised for having been prudent and looked after themselves all of their lives? And a lot of older people feel that, that, you know, that they, they've worked all of their life and now suddenly it's not enough. Yeah, no, there's it's, nothing there for them. It's very resentful making. So listen, I'm afraid we're, we're up to time, but there's one more question I really want to ask you from Sue Judd, and she says, how much does humour help you? <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely does. You know, so when it, it's, you know, it's really easy to say, because obviously in the middle of the night when you've been 
you're up for the fifth time, you know, and particularly if you're caring for somebody who doesn't really know who you are and all of these things, it, you know, there's not a lot of humor to be had. But I, that is what I really feel strongly about the issue of caring, that care if in the, its best circumstances is an act of love and it's about a partnership and it's about trying to be equal. So not being the person who takes over and like, oh, let's be very, very efficient, you know, letting the person you're caring for, if possible, have their own agency and be themselves. And so, you know, we had a terrible thing the other with Rosie once where, and, and I didn't actually put this in the book. And she said, why is this not in the book? And I said, well, I didn't think you'd want this in the book. She said, oh, I don't care if it's in the book. But, you know, she, she had had a fall and she'd got this horrible wound on her leg. Mm. And then she was getting out of bed and she knocked this terrible wound on. Um, and it was like a horror movie, you know, because everything exploded and it was just absolutely terrible. Um, and the thing is, I came in to find Rosie in fits of laughter <laughs> saying, should I be just trying to imagine how I was going to explain what happened here? And of course, it, it was awful. And she was in pain and I was really sad for her because she was in pain. But at the same time, it's like my dad, um, making it possible to not take everything as the end of the world. I think it's that actually. Everybody listening knows, you know, in the book, I talk about this, the, the fact that you never sleep through the night. You always have half an ear open. You walk around in a fog, watching someone you love in pain and not being able to stop it. These things are hor they, these things are awful. They're not funny. But if you can find the humor in things, the fact that Granny Rosie, you know, got her cuffs caught on the door the other day, so essentially threw an entire mug of coffee over the dog because her <laughs> sleeve was, you know, is this a nuisance that there's coffee all over the floor? Well, you know, yes, obviously. Does it matter? No. Not one bit. Not really. Um, because in the end, there's a stain on the carpet, which, you know, there's a stain on the carpet and the dog, you know, looked, you know, the dog is white and then he was a little bit brown and that was fine. Um, and so it, you know, I think, but I think the key thing before we finish is about time and about patience and everybody listening who's a carer will understand this is that you have to let things happen at the pace they happen. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Everything about our working lives, we're told to be quick is to be efficient. When you're a carer, it's about listening to what the other person needs. And it's not about doing it fast. It's about it happening in the way that they want it to happen and you want it to happen. Do we all get impatient? Yes. Do we feel frustrated? Yes, about the same conversations that happen over and over again. Of course, we're all human. But all you can do is just wake up the next morning and think, I'll try and do better today. And that's all I would ever say to myself when I thought I'd not been great carer. I'd think, well, just to be better tomorrow. Just be better tomorrow. Don't be so, you know. And that's all any of us can do. And support each other. Because if we support the carers and carers support each other, and we raise our voices, then we can help care for the carers and things might change and, and they need to change. They need to change. Okay, thank you. I'm incredibly glad that the caring world has now got you as an advocate because you are a brilliant woman at getting things done, <laughs> I think. But uh, you kept the Orange Prize going all these years. The, well, sorry, the Women's Prize. Go women's on. Prize now. That is, a, that is a real, that's a senior moment. Okay, flipping back to the Orange Prize. But anyway, this is a fabulous book, An Extra Pair of Hands. The, I'm holding it up because Rosie doesn't... Yeah, have I've got a proof. So the thing is, I'm more <laughs> capable to hold it up. Yes, it's really wonderful. Um, I enjoyed it so much and I've so enjoyed talking to you. It's really interesting. It's a, such a big issue that actually yeah. that just the chance to talk about it for an hour has been a real privilege. And so, for me as well, actually. Thank you, you know. so much. And it's lovely to see you. And thank you all very much for joining in. Um, thank you for the questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. And yes, we'll see you again soon at 5 by 15 and have a good evening and good night. Good night. <laughs>